Yoji Yamamoto is a fashion design legend. Known for his mannish tailoring and a strictly monochromatic color palette, Yamamoto first hit the international fashion scene in 1981 when he brought his revolutionary design aesthetic to Paris from his native Japan, creating a fashion earthquake and quickly cultivating a global cult following. But while his high fashion approach speaks to the fashion forward, Yamamoto's Y3 collaboration with Adidas pioneered the idea of the fashion meets athletic wear collaboration, creating an altogether new product category that reaches a much broader consumer base. Today, in a rare interview to discuss his highs and lows and wisdom from a career spanning more than 40 years, the business of fashion goes inside Yoji Yamamoto's fashion philosophy. Mr. Yamamoto, thank you for taking the time to sit down with me. It's a, it's a very interesting moment in the fashion world at the moment, and I think mm. um, there's lots to discuss. But I wanted to start um, a little bit earlier in your career, actually, and, and learn a little bit about your decision or um, the idea of becoming a designer. Uh. You know, how, how did you first become a fashion designer, and you know, why... Why was this the, the kind of métier that you chose? I was born as the only son of a war widow. Okay. And then, uh, about when I was, when I became five, six years old, my mother gave up that her husband don't come back. Okay. So, uh, She did a funeral party uh, with all the family, and I didn't understand what's, what, what was going on because uh, uh, I don't have any memory about my father because he went to the war when I was a baby, one year and three months, so I have no memory about my father. So. Uh, in me, he doesn't exist. But my mother is doing something, some ceremony, and I started like this. Yeah. And uh, <coughs> afterwards, she started decide not to get married again. She decided to study cutting and sewing. And after she graduated from school, she started uh, work hardly, just educating me, just eating together. She worked like terribly. And uh, that made me Looking, looking the society through my mother, uh, very hard-working mother. So I disguised to be a good boy for hard-working mother until I passed the uh, exam of the very famous university. I, I have been very good boy. Okay. After entering university, I talked to myself, maybe it's enough. And then I, I started to feel like a very strange feeling. I don't want to be nothing. Uh, I want to make myself stay in moratorium condition. I want to be, I want I, I didn't want to be nothing. Because uh, from childhood, I noticed uh, life is unfair. Yeah. Mm. So uh, I have been angry for many, many things around me, even for society, even for country. I've been angry, so I, I did. I didn't want to hit the hit the reality after graduate, graduating the university. 
so uh, I, I told, told to my mother after graduation, can I have your shop? And she was still a dressmaker? She, yeah, she, she started as a dressmaker in, in the normal uh, cheap house. And uh, gradually she became successful and she opened the shop. Okay. Hmm. So she had a dressmaking shop in uh, Kabukicho, is an amusement town of Shinjuku, very famous place <coughs> for amusement. When I asked her that I don't want to be nothing, so I, I want to help you, she didn't talk to me two weeks. <laughs> But finally, uh, I showed her real myself. Then she said, finally, at least uh, we have four or five sewing assistants. So for, for, for them, uh, you, have to, you have to study at least cutting. So we have to go to dressmaking school. Then I said, yeah, got it. I can continue to be a student. Yeah. <laughs> and then I went to Bunka dressmaking school, a very famous school, mm -hmm. <coughs> moratorium condition. Yeah. What was it like at Bunka? Because it's, um, it's such a famous school, as you say. Yes, yes. And I think, compared to some of the fashion schools or design schools in the West, the approach for teaching is really different. At that moment, I mean, at that moment, I, I went to Bunka. The, the Bunka dressmaking school was a sort of uh, uh, young girls uh, uh, not real school, it's like a, uh, classes for getting marriage, preparation for getting marriage, uh, for our arrangement, cooking, and dressmaking, oh, right. and something like that. Were there many men in the school? Very few. Okay. And was it during that period when you were studying at Bunka that you first developed or found your design voice? It's your chance to discover your creativity. I didn't even know that there, there exists sort of business called fashion designer. Yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah. And when I was uh, stepping up to basic course to design course, design course classmate taught me th that there is a business so-called fashion designer. Even that, I didn't understand. I didn't know, I didn't understand what does it mean, fashion design. I just wanting, I was just wanting to ma study making clothes, cutting and sewing. So uh, after graduate, uh, I got a prize from school, so I was sent to Paris about one year. Uh, living in Paris without nothing, without doing nothing, I became like a very, very hopeless boy. Hopeless in what sense? Because when I studied fashion, it was, uh, it was a moment of uh, the last haute couture people, Pierre Gaudin, Monsieur Pierre Gaudin, Monsieur André Correge, uh, just Monsieur Yves Saint Laurent. He started ready to wear. So I just studied. Old picture, not ready to wear. 
And after graduating school, I, I was sent to Paris, and I found Haute Couture time is going to finish. And uh, the new movement of ready to wear has started. Yeah. So when I was, uh, when I was sitting in the cafe of Dumago and uh, writing letters to, to home, home, home country, to, to my mother, uh, it was very, very, very strong shock by opening revolving door of, of Cafe du Mango. Many ready-to-wear fashionable girls came in. Kenzo, jean Castor Kasturbajak, Sonia Rikia. I was shocked yeah. because I only studied haute couture. Yeah. Mm. So I, I, in that, that is the reason I felt I'm nothing. I, I can't. I can't afford it. I have no idea. I felt. So I decided to come come back to Japan mm -hmm. and started uh, helping mother again. Just taking order and uh, measurement and the cutting fabric and the fitting for many type of customers. And then you were working with your mother again? Yeah. And then you spent some time in Tokyo and you, you continued to work. Mm -hmm. And then you know, a few years later, in the early 1980s, mm -hmm. you came back. What brought you back to Paris? During helping my mother, the uh, the out outfit dressed, which ordered by so many type of women, they were all kind of doll-like, sexy, gorgeous. feminine like which I didn't like too much. So uh, during fitting fitting on the on the customer's body and the kneeling down on the customer's body and uh, fixing the length up I was thinking oh I won't I won't make something kind of manish outfit for women. And gradually, this, this feeling gradually came up. So that's, that was what, what became your voice eventually, the signature that eventually, I'm talking yeah, about. Yeah. It came as a way of rejecting what you were seeing in the women that your mother was dressing. Hmm. So I was very hungry. Yeah, you're right. That moment, I was uh, holding my dynamite in my mind. So at, at the beginning, I was uh, making money at mother's uh, dressmaking shop and putting money for ready to wear company, very small company. This ready to wear small company didn't make money at the longest three years or four years. It took time. Yeah. And then how did you decide to, sh to bring it to Paris? I was looking on the wall and, well, uh, I've done enough in Japan. Maybe in Paris, there are some very few number of people can find my clothes 
interesting. Might be. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to make, uh, open a small shop in Paris. So this was uh, 1980 or 1981. So mm -hmm. I came to open the shop. But exactly the same day of my opening sh shop, uh, Mrs. Rika Wakubo, mm -hmm. she made a show in some hotel. I didn't know that, that she comes. We have been friends, very close. So one year ago, I, I, I talked to her, Reza, let's go to Paris because uh, we are free by uh, selling in Japan. Uh, why don't you go to Paris with me? And then she told me, no, no, my company cannot make it. It's impossible. She said, I don't go. You can go first. So, okay, then I will go, go first. Okay. <laughs> but uh, finally, very co coincidentally, two Japanese designer made a shop opening show. She made only show in hotel. Anyway, two designers from Japan made a show. And what was the reaction? Because at the time in Paris, the contemporary fashion was very different from what from what you and Mrs. Kawakubo. Mr. Terry Miguel, Mr. Claude Montana, yeah. they were they were they looked like kings. Right. Huh. So uh, mines and their uh, Garçon's outfit is very far from their their quality and sense of beauty. So uh, <coughs> reaction was very interesting. Many journalists hated us, but buyers, buyers are always looking for something new. During the journalists, only Liberation wrote excellent article for us. Only Liberation. The others, they said, oh no, go away, yeah. go back. <coughs> but buyers, they came to the office. Finally, they broke the elevator because of the... They broke the elevator. Yeah. Because there were so many of them. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't understand what was going on, what was happening. And was there something, you know, distinctly Japanese about what you and Ms. Kawakubo brought to Paris? Was there something similar or that something that tied it together? Or was it just a, kind of an happy ac accident? Kind of, kind of similar. <coughs> kind of similar. In what way? Uh, Asymmetrical. And then using many blacks, monotone. And then some of them are broken, burnt, washed. For not only European people, for ordinary people, our creation of clock making 
looked, looked very, uh, very dirty and ugly. Might be. Mm. And, the, and the kind of interest in black, the use of black fabrics and black color. Mm. You know, why, why is that such an important part of your process and your... It, it is my private sensibility. You know, like, like in Tokyo, New York, Paris, so many uh, people from the outside uh, are walking around uh, at Metropolitan. Uh, and uh, in the city, when I looked, the f so many fashions, so many colors, so many decorations, it looked very ugly. I felt at least myself should not uh, make people's eyes disturbed by using horrible color. So I stay in monotone. So I, I started keep wearing black or navy blue. Not to, not to disturb people. Right. This is very, very starting. Mm. And then, when I making, when I started making clothes, I didn't use mostly sentimental colors. I didn't need color, color sentiment. I just wanted to uh, show people cut or wash or broken or find something closes raw or closest charm for me, right. not for an uh, ordinary customer. Right. Mm. The other thing I wanted to spend some time on is thinking about fashion as a business. I mean, you said earlier that mm. your colleagues or friends that you met at Bunka, mm. some of them were the ones who told you about the world as fashion mm. design as a mm. business. And clearly taking taking a very creative point of view, a very you know, refined and specific type of creativity and making it work as a business is probably one of the biggest challenges that creative biggest people face. Biggest gamble. Biggest gamble. Biggest gamble. Mm, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's a huge risk. Yeah, huge risk. I've seen it happen to young designers that I know that all of a sudden they get a lot of attention. Mm. They're in the press, the media, the buyers are coming to them. Mm. And they're not yet equipped to Equip. handle mm. that business side, which is then you have to deliver, and then you have to you know, regularly put something out. Exactly. Uh, press, it's quite easy to deliver. The most difficult thing is gathering money. Pay me. Yeah, cash flow. Very, very, very hard. Yeah. In that meeting, also, we were lucky. Yeah. Maybe, probably, I'm talking about the very important moment. Not only fashion. In music scene, there appeared Beatles, Rolling Stones, they came out. The adults and the American people didn't understand. But young people, they were all... They got it. Got it. Excited. 
and they changed the music scene totally. And uh, as a result, we did the same thing. Yeah. A few years ago, in October of 2009, mm. you faced some big business difficulties. Oh, yeah. Um, and you know, this is probably a very difficult moment for you because you learned mm. that you, know, you had built this very high profile business, but there were some challenges with the business. You know, how, how have things changed for you since then? You, you found an investor to kind of help run and manage the business side, and now you're free? Oh, yeah. Uh, one guy came to my company. Uh, he wanted to ma uh, pre manage management of my company. And he looked very, very attractive, <coughs> charming guy. So I decided let him decide business. And he decided to make everything bigger. And then craft. At that moment, I felt, very frankly, I did enough. So uh, I don't want to have chapter 11. Mm -hmm. uh, I wanted to finish my career. But uh, my daughter, She shouted, don't finish now. We start again. My daughter made it. So your daughter kept you going. She's yeah. the one who convinced you. Yeah. I, I told her, Rimi, don't do that. Don't. I did enough. I, I feel even tired, so don't do that, but no, Father, let me do that. So uh, finally I, I accepted chapter 11, mm. because I, I, I had to think about my company, people's life, so many, so many staff, assistant, many people, and uh, weaving company, uh, dying company, People. It wasn't yeah. just about you. Yeah, it's just when I started to think about them, oh, I had to study it again. It was a very hard moment. But as far as I made up my mind to do it again, I became, I feel like I became double st strong. Yeah. There's, um, there's a, a one really great business success story, I think, in your career, which presaged things that came later, and that's your, been your collaboration with Adidas. Oh, Adidas, yeah. Which shows that some business partnerships can be really great and really successful. Yeah, very unfair and, uh, and rare. And rare. Yeah, and rare. And if you look now what's happening in fashion and mm -hmm. the interest mm -hmm. and the combination and the intersection between very high fashion and athletic clothing, mm. athletic, yeah. it's everywhere now. Mm. In a way, you were the pioneer because you know, for a long time those two worlds were so separate. Mm, yeah. Can you talk about how that Adidas collaboration oh. came about and, and what you've taken away and what you've learned from it? After, after working in Paris about uh, 20 years, 
I felt I became too far from the street. Yeah. I, st I started feeling that who, who is wearing my creation? I, I, I can't find people who are wearing my outfit in the street. Maybe in the museum. Maybe they are, they are simply collectors of strange things. I felt very uneasy. I felt I came too far from the street. And then I, I got surprised that from the uh, United States, the, the sneaker culture started. Mm. Uh, many businessmen uh, in the morning they go to the company uh, wearing suit and sneaker. And some of the sneaker looked like ugly, like a uh, <laughs> monster. But uh, I did, oh, sneaker culture. Maybe it must be interesting to work with sneaker. So uh, from my side, directly call, make a phone call to Adidas company. Aren't you interested in collaborate with me? then directly, quickly, might be, must be interesting. The answer came back. So we started it 12 years ago. The, the title of the brand was uh, Sport Gorgeous. I didn't understand the meaning of Sport <laughs> Gorgeous, <laughs> but anyway. We started and continued 12 years already. And uh, Y3 now is uh, very successful. Yeah. Before we finish, I wanted to ask you a few questions about fashion today. Because as fashion I mentioned today. at the beginning, mm. it's a really interesting moment in fashion mm. because everybody seems to be questioning. Where so, sorry? Everybody seems to be questioning, questioning yes. where we've ended up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, there's, there's so much product, there's so many designers, mm. there's so many fashion shows, yeah, there's yeah. so much waste. Yeah. If, what, you know, what do you think of the fashion industry, the fashion system now? For me, fashion business became money business. And they look sexy and messy. And I felt I have been losing my competitors year by year. In Japan, you mean? In the world. In the world. Mm. Especially, clothing designer decreasing. Only stylists, they were asked by big maison, big house, and make a show for selling accessories, not for selling their own creation. The m ma majority of business became like that. And I call, call it mainstream of fashion. I'm not working in the mainstream. I'm working in the side street, side dark street. It is quite comfortable. 
if I join to the mainstream, maybe I was killed. Company would go down. Yeah. I mean, what do you think, as an industry, what do you think we should be doing to solve this problem, though? Because it, it doesn't seem sustainable, to me at least, mm. to continue at this pace with this much volume of things. Mm. What's the solution? Hmm. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. When I speak with young designers, I, I talk to them, shut your computer. Don't look at computer. Don't look at your desire, your future, your uh, favorite thing in computer. Uh, if you really want to see r real thing, real beauty, you have to you have to go there by walking and go there and touch it and smell it. Don't use computer, otherwise you cannot get real emotion. You need, if, if you want to create something, you need real excitement, emotion, not uh, superficial vision. So I, 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 to I told them, be blind. You can copy somebody whom you very much, you like very much. You can copy it, copy it, copy it, copy it, copy it. That, until, until the end of the copy, you can find yourself. Don't look too, you know, too wide. If you, if you look, look the, seen t too wide, you lose yourself. You'll be... You'll be lost. Mm. So, uh, uh, you young people are not uh, yet uh, really having individuality or strong power. Uh, creating is making life. Uh, so if you want to create something, keep resisting to the to the mediocrity, ordinary thing against against against. It's a hard way. Uh, it's it's a life work. Are you ready to sacrifice yourself to, to create something? Mm. I'm asking them. Mm. Mm. Thank you, Mr. Yamamoto. Thank you. Very nice <laughs> to chat with you. It's <laughs> good advice. That's good? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.